So, um, as Mike mentioned, my name is Michelle, and I'm going to be talking to you today about some other work that we're doing in ophthalmology uh, in informatics, and that is looking at clinic workflows. And just to, as you may figure out as we talk, that the probably the biggest difference between Mike and I is that he is an ophthalmologist and clinician, has a uh, medical degree. I am a computer scientist, so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is much more related to kind of methods in data science and analysis and how we can use that to help clinicians um, practice medicine. So um, just you know, sort of some of the acknowledgments and the um, financial disclosures are always put at the beginning of our um, slides. But um, just to orient you, um, this is work that we do at KCI Institute at OHSU. And it's got all the major subspecialties of ophthalmology, has um, many uh, providers and annual patient encounters, but probably what makes it the most unique, at least in the country, is that it has this dedicated informatics research, research center, which as far as I know is pretty unique. I'm not sure we, there is another one. And this is our group, and you know, I'm not going to read all of these names out, but it's a big combination of Mike and I and students from DMICE from a KCI Institute, from the medical school, and then our interns. And so Michael's working with me um, this summer. Unfortunately, what I'm talking about today isn't very directly related to what Mike's doing, Michael's doing, but he will certainly talk about that later, so you'll get to hear about that. But what I'm going to be talking about today is the work that we've been doing in studying clinic workflows. So for those of you who don't know what a clinic workflow is or any workflow is, is that it's really just a set of steps or processes that sort of something has to go through to, com to be completed. So in this case, we're looking at how, what are the steps that a patient has to go through to complete an exam, and in this case, it's an ophthalmology. So the steps might be something like they check in, they do an initial exam in ophthalmology that's done by a technician who does, you know, gets started on the visual exam or the eye exam, and then the physician comes in, completes the exam, and, um, and then they're checked out. Now, the one thing that is a part of all of these steps, as you might notice, is a computer and electronic health record. There's all this interaction with the electronic health record, um, and that's going to become important as we uh, talk about how we study this. So, but first of all, I want to talk about why do we even study this in the first place. So studying workflows is really about studying the efficiency of them. And efficiency is important because it can affect patient satisfaction. So if it's an inefficient clinic, you can have high wait times and it can make patients upset and, and not come back or not want to get their care there, go somewhere else. Uh, it, can it can affect finances um, because if you're not seeing as many patients as you could, you could be losing out on some uh, income. But it can also affect provider burnout if they're doing a lot of extra steps or things are taking a really long time and that provider burnout is a very hot topic right now. But the challenge is how do we study this? So, you know, in the past, this kind of the simple ways of doing this would be for people to go in person, observe what the clinicians are doing, maybe take some timing um, data as well. But the problem with this is that it's expensive because it's labor intensive, it's time consuming, and it's a very limited scale. So you might be able to do an observation, but it would be for you know very particular, you know, clinic at that particular time, and it wouldn't capture changes that might happen over time or that might be different between different providers or clinics. So we really wanted to find a better, more robust way to study these workflows. So this is where the EHR comes in and the secondary use of, of the data that's within the EHR. And I think by now all of you know that the EHR just contains all sorts of data about patients. Um, they come in, there's things that are recorded during their clinical exams, there's, result, there's lab results, there's medications, there's all sorts of things. And a lot of times when people talk about secondary use of EHR data, they're talking more about how do we use data that was recorded, clinical data that was recorded to somehow improve clinical care. And what we're going to be looking at instead are um, what we call audit log data. So audit log data is data that's stored in the EHR, but it's collected as people use the EHR. And there are regulations that require EHRs to log 
things about EHR use. So you need to know, you know, for example, who looked at a chart, for what patient. And these audit logs look like this. It records the time that, you know, there was some sort of interaction. Who did it, you know, for what patient, and there's usually a context, like for what, pa not just for what patient, but for, for what visit were they doing this. Um, what they were doing in the EHR and where, what computer were they on. Now, uh, there can be different granularities in terms of how many entries you have, how often those entries show up in the audit log data. Those are different options. There's also um, some variation in terms of what this data looks like depending on who your EHR vendor is. But in any case, there are just billions of entries in the EHR about all this log and it really is a significant majority of the data that's actually stored within the EHR. So being able to mine this to do our studies would be fantastic. So this is sort of a graphic that represents sort of a pictorial view you might look at, or a timeline, looking at how those audit log entries happen. And I have to thank my po uh, our postdoc, Adam, for creating this, this graphic. So each one of those little vertical slashes represents an auto log entry. So there's a whole bunch of data that, you know, according to that, or, you know, corresponding to that. So there's the, the time, there's, you know, who did it, what patient, what visit, you know, what computer. And you can see here that this is just sort of an example for one provider, and, you, and it's divided up into which patient they were working on. And then you can kind of see over time all, how all these, these um, entries kind of line up. So then we can do different things with them. So the first thing is we're going to look at the exam times. So using contextual data about our patient, we know when they're checked in, we know, you know, which workstations are, you know, clinic exam rooms. We can actually identify, oh, okay, so these timestamps happened here. We think this is when they had an exam. And we can figure out when the first and last one was and say, oh, okay, so that's how long we think their exam happened. So this gives us a way of measuring exam times for many, many patients, for many providers over time, which is great and allows us to do a lot of different things. So I'm going to talk through kind of a lot of different topics of or ways that we use this. So one is um, we've used them as part of a discrete event simulation model. And so these are just models that help us, they can model any workflow. And they were started actually for manufacturing, but anything that can be divided up into steps and so for each step, we have to know essentially a distribution of how long that step is going to take and what resources they need. So in our case, we use the audit log data to generate distributions of exam times that each of our exam steps took. We also had distributions from the EHR on when patients arrived relative to their scheduled time, so we could generate those distributions as well. And then we can run these simulations based on different parameters. And in this case, we were testing how scheduling affected things. So then that scheduling sort of affected how those patients uh, arrived. And for the different schedules, we are able to measure, you know, according to the simulation, how much patients would have waited. So um, for scheduling, what we're trying to do is we're trying to mitigate those kind of really busy and slow periods in clinics, we're trying to kind of create a steady stream of patients as much as we can so that we can minimize wait time. And we know from the literature from prior research that scheduling according to length and variability can really help even out those times. So we used simulation to kind of see what happens when we have long patient encounters, so long office visits, and where do we put them in the clinic day? So if we put them at the beginning, so if that's at block one, which is to the right of here, what does the wait time look like versus as we start moving it, you know, each block down, um, you know, the clinic day? And so if you get to the end, all the way to the right, that would be at the end of the clinic day. And you can see that the blue line represents what the average wait time was, and it does go down. Um, but the orange line represents the, the clinic length, and you can see that it does actually increase. And so clinic managers had been scheduling pa long patients at the beginning, and they decided, okay, looking at this, maybe we need to start moving our long patients closer to the end of the clinic so we can, um, you know, mitigate that patient wait time. And what happens is when the long patients are at the beginning is that you just get behind and then it just gets worse from there. So what we did was we actually separated patients into short, medium, and long 
categories and then schedule them according to that with the short ones at the beginning, medium in the, begin in the middle, and then we didn't put long at the very end because we didn't want them extending into lunch or at the end of the day. We implemented this in all pediatric ophthalmology clinics and for now, the physicians are helping us categorize the patients according to short, medium, and long. And um, when we implemented this in our initial clinic, we um, really decreased the average patient wait time. And at the same time, um, it just so happened that the provider was increasing their volume. So even though that they increased their volume on average over one patient per clinic, we still managed to decrease their average wait time, which was pretty good. We rolled it out into the rest of the um, providers in pediatrics. They all were able to increase their clinic volume without increasing their patient wait time, and then some, most of them actually decreased it. Um, the only one that didn't actually increase their patient volume by quite a bit. So um, that was one way of using it. The other way is now we're looking at how do we predict these exam times. We were using providers, but can we do a better job? Because now we have thousands, we have potentially data about thousands of, of exams that we can get from the EHR using the audit logs. And can we use machine learning? And can it do better than providers? So we used the prior exam links along with some other features about the patients in the exam. And we found that uh, we had 65% accuracy in terms of categorizing them, short, medium, and long, using machine learning, uh, whereas the providers were only about 42% accurate. And we're still working on ways to improve the accuracy, but we're hoping that that's going to help us with this and actually make our results even better if we can schedule patients or be able to predict how long they're going to take and schedule them accordingly. Um, and then the next way that we've used these audit logs is it's just a slight variation of this, and it is looking at just when, just at the different time or the different minutes that we have EHR use. And it's not a perfect way of, measure, of measuring EHR use, but it's the best one we have. So we just say, if you use the EHR in this minute, then, you know, that was time spent on the EHR, and we can count that. So now we can potentially use this to measure EHR time use for you know, providers over a wide variety of settings, including at home, where observation really isn't a uh, possibility. So um, we were able to do this in ophthalmology. So this is total EHR use, both um, in clinic and out of clinic. And we actually categorized it as well, whether it was a way that's directly related to a patient visit versus other things like inbox messaging and that sort of thing. And this just sort of shows that, that providers are consistently using the EHR really at least half of their day, some of them even more, and we think this is an underestimate. So this, the EHR is really predominating in their work. Um, and not only that, whoops, but we were able to see over time how this has changed. So at OHSU, we started using uh, an EHR in 2006. So we looked at 10 years of use, and you can see that it increased. And we were able to actually sort of correlate that, not, I shouldn't use the word correlate that, line that up with when meaningful use, the different forms of meaningful use happened. And you can see that there was a big um, bump in the amount of time that um, providers were using the EHR um, for the different meaningful use stages. But it looks like it's kind of stabilizing, and we're studying that right now in terms of um, what, how people are using it and why you know, it might be becoming more efficient or maybe leveling off. And finally, the, one of the ways we've used this to measure um, this documentation time is we were able to use and see what the impact of scribes is on provider documentation time. So we were able to show that um, in the patient appointment, obviously providers aren't using the EHR as much because the scribe is using the EHR. But this graph shows you what happens after the visit. And you can pour uh, seven of our ophthalmology providers Four of them actually spent more time, on average, using the EHR after the visit than when they didn't have a scribe. And um, three of them actually uh, used it less. But this is an important, kind of an important result because one of the reasons that people use scribes is to kind of avoid burnout. And if you're still having to do more work after the exam, especially at home, those are the things that have been tied to burnout that scribes might not be the perfect answer for that. So that's a paper that is coming out soon. 
And then finally, the last way that we've been using this, or at least I'm going to talk about, is not only looking at time, but looking at what people are looking at in the EHR. So as I mentioned before, each one of those slashes could give us information about you know, what patient, what provider. It also gives us uh, information about what visit. So we can look at these reviews and be able to see how many prior offices at notes, how many other encounters did a provider look at during the course of an exam. So, um, so we can actually sort of determine what users are look at kind of what they're doing in the EHR without uh, direct observation. So this is what we found out. So um, there's some variation here, but on general, in general, we looked at orange is, these are prior offices at notes, and the blue bars represent non-offices at notes, so they'd be things like lab results. And you can see that um, on average, it's about three notes per visit are reviewed. Half of them are office visits, half of them aren't. It varies quite a bit um, by provider in terms of how many are reviewed. And um, we think this relates to both um, the limited time that providers have, but also uh, the design of the EHR and how easy or hard it is to actually do review of prior notes um, in electronic health record. And this is also um, spurring some additional research into how to make this uh, EHR more efficient and how to uh, provide the in better provide or manage or support, I should say, the information needs of providers at the time of care. So, uh, but there are some limitations to this type of analysis in using audit log data. Our workflow time estimates and the, the documentation time may not be accurate. So our exam times might not actually correspond, may not begin or end with the HR use, so then we don't haven't captured that full um, time. We also um, kind of rely on the fact that we know which workstations are, you know, are exam rooms, so we can actually identify which time stamps happen during the exam. But when providers use laptops, then we can't do that. Um, also, the gaps in time are really difficult to interpret. We don't know if a gap in time, especially in an exam, is because the provider stopped using the HR and is now examining the patient, is, but is still with the patient, or if they got called out of the room, right? Maybe they had a phone call of emergency and they left. So, um, you know, it can be difficult to interpret. Um, the granularity of each our timestamps can be limited, especially on a large scale. So when a provider, for example, is writing a note that often generates just one timestamp and we don't know, we don't have a begin and end time. So we don't know if, there, if there's a gap that they wrote, if they have a timestamp that says, okay, I'm writing a note and we had another timestamp two hours later or whatever, were they writing the note that whole time? Or were, you know, did they all go off and do something else and come back? So it can really make it difficult to interpret some things. Um, but it's also an incomplete record of EHR use. So the audit log will only require things that are done within the EHR. It won't record things like, for example, in ophthalmology, there's often looking at images and we don't have any record because it's a separate system. So we have to um, get access to that to get those kind of, that kind of data. But in summary, um, I've shown you essentially you know, how we use audit log data in three different ways that we've um, managed to do this. Um, it allows for really large-scale studies that wouldn't be possible in person. Um, but it's also become a really popular um, source for data for doing studies. And I'm actually part of a national research network of audit log users. And I'm managing a group right now that is trying to define the measures that, audit, that you can create from audit log measure or, or audit log data to try and standardize and make them more reproducible. So for example, if I said I you know, did this study, audit log shows that our docs spend this much time using the EHR, that someone would be able to go out at their own institution and repeat that study for their own institution, their own doctor, so we can actually start to make some meaningful comparisons. Um, so that's just sort of a summary of what I do, and it's, as you can tell, a little bit more data focused. Um, but it's still related to clinical care. So uh, for those of you who are, might be a little bit more interested in the computer or data side of things as opposed to being involved, directly involved in clinical care, this is a really excellent opportunity for very, very interesting sources, enriched sources of data and being able to do really interesting types of analysis. So, um, 
don't know. At this point, I don't know if there's any questions, and you can ask questions of me or Mike at this point. Um, <laughs> so you talked about some of the uncertainties in using the audit log data. So how would you validate that? That's a really good question. Um, <laughs> Adam smiling. Uh, and one of the other things I should mention too is that um, as part of this work group, um, well, it's not really part of the work group, but Adam is actually working on a, a review paper of all the literature and all the, the studies that have been published using audit log data and validation is actually something that is not reported on very reliably and there are very few studies that validated it. We're one of the few groups that has validated it or try, attempted to um, and even then it's showing us that it's not perfect. So we've actually gone and done in-person studies and then looked at the audit logs and lined them up and said okay in this case it's about you know, it's up to one or three minutes difference. Um, when you're looking at something like documentation time where you're only using it for three minutes, if you're off by a minute, that's a big percentage, right? Um, if you're talking about exam times, which might be more on the order of, you know, 10 or 11 minutes, then that isn't as big of a uh, difference. One of the things that, um, that the vendors are doing, at least from what they're reporting in the, the work groups that I'm working on, is they're trying to come up with better granularity of results so that we have more data and we can, um, so we're not just having a single entry for each action. So we can have a better sense of when that begins and ends so that uh, we can improve that granularity and it validates a little bit better. But that's a really good question. It's one of the challenges that uh, we're working on and trying to, to come up with re recommendations for. In terms of the, the validation that Michelle had done, it was basically that I know you talked a little bit about a series of several hundred, about 400 encounters, that there were sort of what we'd call gold standard data, which was somebody following a doctor and a patient around with an iPad and logging what they actually did and then comparing it with these audit log scores. And the short answer is that it works um, like pretty well, except when it doesn't. Um, and um, you know, when it doesn't is basically when doctors, like Michelle was saying, when they don't do that standard workflow, they log in before the patient showed up, or they, um, and then, then you know, th that's when you get those errors, but probably 70% of the time, it's, it's within, you know, roughly a minute or two of the actual time. Yeah, and one of our challenges, of course, is validating it for use at home. And, and, and so we can do self-reported data from that, we tried that, and, um, that was just, we thought, okay, we'll just have them record, and, and that was really, really off. <laughs> it didn't work at all. So um, we're still trying, we were just discussing at a meeting this morning what, how you could potentially um, validate that better, and how much of this is just waiting for better granularity or better reporting from the, the vendors. Any other questions? For wearable devices for um, validating workflow processes and validating audit log data with um, using wearable devices? Yeah, and in fact, um, that is something we've looked into. Um, there was actually more problems with the data that we got from the wearable devices than there was with the audit log data. There was a lot of problems with interference and trying to figure out exactly where you were. Um, it, it tracks things differently. Um, I have seen work done by another group in ophthalmology at the University of Michigan where they have been using RFID tracking to try and um, to do these timings and locations, and they their accuracy is something like 60 to 70 percent accurate um, from what they've been able to figure out. So 
it's not any better than the audit log data, so using it as a way to validate audit log data isn't necessarily great either. Um, so yeah, there's just limitations uh, to this. The, the one thing that is a possibility that you could do is uh, uh, turn on, there's options for turning on a much higher granularity of, essentially it's, it's recording everything you're doing, like all the keystrokes, all the, this stuff so that you could potentially um, get a little bit better accuracy and try and figure out you know, what were you really doing and then if you're not looking at every single timestamp, you know, how close are we getting? Um, because the you can't have that turned on all the time because it's just too much data. So uh, that's another possibility and, and things that people are talking about doing in terms of validation. Well, thank you for coming, and uh, good luck to all of you.